You're listening to the UKC Hunting Ops Podcast, celebrating hunting dog heritage, competition, and community. United Kennel Club has been the hunting dog sports home for coonhounds, beagles, retrievers, pointers, cur feist, and more for over 125 years. Thanks for joining in. I'm Dominic Moyo, and I'm the Hunt, Test, and Field Trial Program Manager here at the United Kennel Club. And today I get to sit down with Tracy Stubbs, and Tracy does quite a bit of work with the HRC, the Hunting Retrievers brand, the international brand. And, well, Tracy, let's first introduce yourself a little bit, maybe give some background on, on your life in the retriever world and what it is you do with the brand. All right. Well, thanks for having me, Dominic. I appreciate this opportunity to talk about one of my favorite subjects. So uh, my name is Tracy Stubbs. I live in Union Springs, Alabama. I'm a new transplant here. been about a year from Florida, and uh, I've been involved with HRC since about 1999 and uh, had several generations of retrievers now. Um, my official title is the International Grand Chairman, so uh, I'm kind of in charge of, of that event uh, for the Hunting Retriever Club. So uh, that's about what my main function is. Well, good deal. So if somebody came to you on the street, or, well, I guess it probably happens in Union Springs, considering that's a big hotspot for the pointer world, but somebody who's not as familiar with retrievers, how do you briefly explain, explain what the Grand is? Okay. I guess if you if you want to talk about what the grand is, is you got to go back and talk about what HRC is and and how to come up through HRC. Um, the uh, the Hunting Retriever Club was started by some guys out of uh, North Louisiana. Uh, Omar Driscoll is is our founder, and uh, he uh, wanted to have a program that we com uh, competed against a standard instead of against each other. And so you know the the organization developed the standard, and you you license judges, and the judges understand the standard. And, uh, you know, you run against the judge's standard. So uh, at the local level, which is your local clubs, and I think we're up to around 150 clubs in the HRC now and growing every day. And uh, we uh, have three levels, uh, and there's two programs and three levels in HRC. The first program is a retriever program, and you have a started level, which is a basic gun dog. This is a dog that will go get your birds and come back. And, and you know, it's, that's your introduction. And you can utilize him as a hunting dog, and, and you know that's that's what his function is. Then you have an intermediate level, which we call the season level, and that's that's your your meat hunter duck dog. He can see a, a double retrieve and, and go get them delivered a hand. He's steady at the line, you know. Um, he can run simple blind retrieves, and these are all outlined in the rule books and the and the philosophies of, of what we're looking for. But that's, that's, that's a gun dog. That's a dog that you're going to take duck hunting and he's going to get your birds for you. And at the top level at the, at the local events is the finish level dog. And that's a dog that can see multiple marks and run more complicated blinds and, uh, you know, be steady to hand is, is, a, is a quiet dog at the line and, you know, comes to and from the, the blind with you. And so that's, that's a really good gun dog. And, uh, Whenever the uh, the founders of the organization got that going, and all of a sudden folks would get to the finish level, and then they're like, "Well, what do I do now?" And the idea of the Grand was uh, started. And what the Grand is is the best gun dog. This is a dog that will get you invited wherever there are ducks. If you've got a Grand dog, he's going to get you an invite just on the dog's ability itself. Um, it's a very polished dog. It operates with precision and style. It's quiet. It walks. It sits quietly. It watches birds. It can get complicated marked retrieves, and that's the birds it sees goes down. You know, triple triple marked retrieves, um, difficult varying terrain, um, and then they can run more complicated blinds with with a high degree of difficulty and run it with precision and style. So um, the when the program was developed, it was done as a, a national event. Uh, it's managed by the national organization, not the local, but we also, we, we incorporate a local club to be the host club, and then we work with them to build their event. Um, so the grand is set there, and it's set up on a five-series format. And let me go back to the other program in HRC, which is our Upland program. It is uh, primarily a flushing dog uh, program where, you know, a retriever uh, uses a, a quartering flushing, has to be steady to gun, uh, to wing and shot. 
and uh, retrieve the birds and, you know, honor another dog. So that needed to be incorporated in the national event. And so that would, gets us to our series. So when you run the grand, the grand is all these dogs that has to be a hunting retriever champion to be eligible to run it. And then uh, there's five series. There's two water series, two land series, and then the fifth series is an upland quartering event. And you must pass all five series to get a grand qualification. You need two grand qualifications and 100 championship points. Um, you need 100 championship points to enter the grand. And then you need two grand qualifications and 300 championship points to be a grand hunting retriever champion. So that, in a nutshell, is the grand program. Sure. And uh, we just came off of our uh, our fall grand in Paducah, Kentucky, and uh, out at Kevel at the Western Kentucky WMA, and it was our largest grand ever. We had 998 entries, and uh, after scratches and heats and all that, we started the event with 918 dogs, which is our our largest event ever. Awesome. Now, for for other people that don't know, the grand also happens twice a year, right? You have your spring That's and correct. your fall. Uh, with that being the largest event, what what's the history of the grand? What was the first grand? When was it? And and what was the entries like back then? The uh, the first grand was held in uh, I believe in near Monroe in uh, Louisiana and Ruston, and uh, I won. I don't know the exact numbers. I've had to have, uh, search back some of the the founders and found those number, but it was about uh, fifteen dogs, I believe. Uh, the first grand champion was a dog named uh, Dave Chase. So uh, a very good dog out of Arkansas, I believe. And so that's that's where we came from was, you know, a very low, low entry. And uh, we have definitely enjoyed the success in the grand in the last uh, six years or so. Um, you know, it's it, there's a lot of interest in the dog world in general. And I think all events are growing, um, you know, so we, we have been able to capitalize on that and bring that to the to the grand and to our local clubs. All, you know, it's. It's not easy getting in an HRC test anymore. You know, it used to, uh, when I first got started, you could show up the day of from Florida and go to South Carolina and you could still get entered. And uh, now they're, they're closed weeks in advance on entries. And so that's a good thing for our organization. It's, it's growth and the popularity of it and, you know, just the better, better dogs that we're producing. Absolutely. You know, one of the biggest reasons for really any competitive dog sport is to in some way better the breeding programs behind it and produce more dogs that are capable of high level work and, and are able to to see situations like what HRC puts in front of them and to hear about you know years and years ago there being you know 15 dogs entered and uh, now we're we're nearing we're closing on a thousand at the start of the grand is it speaks volumes for what the program is accomplishing for these retrievers and, and the caliber of dogs that are being produced and the caliber of training that goes into them. Um, how long ago was the first grand? Do you have a roundabout how long it's been running? Uh, 1986. Okay. It was the first grand. So, man, that means it's nearing on 40 years of, of grands. That's, That's a lot of them. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So explain a little bit about where the grand tends to be. Um, I know it moves around a little bit, but you know what you guys have to look for when you're picking a, a area or a place to host the grand at. Okay, you know um, it, it's been all over our country and and Canada, um, mainly Eastern Canada because that's where the the highest density of the clubs are from Canada. But uh, what we look for. Um, in, in looking for a site to host the grand is, is a local club that is willing to to jump in there and give it their all that that's that's probably the number one thing is if we we need a partner in, in handling this at the local level with with boots on the ground in the local area and uh as we've grown now we've gone from from four flights to 10 flights and and you know growth in the in the near future here to 12 if if things continue the way they are is we need those sites and uh you know, we have to manage this in, in a five day format is, is how we're set up with our rules. And uh, so we need a place that, that uh, we need duck water. You know, we need that shallow water ponds and, you know, uh, where we don't have to stretch them out to max distances and things like that, where we can manage time to still have a quality event. And so that gets more and more difficult um, every year, but it's still very accomplished. There's a, you got to have those local folks that know the area and have those resources. 
Um, we have some places that we like to return to because they're just great grounds. You have great clubs there um, where we just came from at, at the Western Kentucky WMA that the group, they've swapped it around. We've had three grands at the, that facility and it's been swapped around each time with a different club, but the region six clubs all jump in there and work it together. And it, it's actually a pretty incredible group to be involved with. And we have several of those groups around the country that, that jump in on those, those grands. But we're looking for those sites um, with the ducky water. You know, that's that's what we are. We're in camo. We're shooting a, a shotgun with primer loads over it. And, you know, we want to be as, as much true to hunting form. We hide the winger hides and, you know, that stuff that, that we're duck hunting to still be able to test and, you know, and, and test that level of proficiency. And then land, we want a, a varying terrain land. You know, you don't just use the flat open field. You want to have varying terrain and cover and those kinds of things. And then the upland is, you know, if we can have some some good cover that's that's been blocked or somehow managed that that we can utilize, that works great for us. So. Sure. Now, as far as the, you know, we talked a little bit about the caliber of what the Grand is. It's kind of the Super Bowl for for the retriever, the hunting retriever. Um, what's the, when we look at things like pass rate, you know, if you, if you show up to the grand aside from training and, you know, dog having a good day, what would you expect your chances of actually passing be? What's your, your average pass rate? Well, everybody likes numbers. Um, you know, and, and this, it's hard to quantify those numbers because of the, we swap locations. It's very test varying judges you know, those kinds of things. But historically, our numbers are between 20 and 25% pass rate. Um, you know, there's been years that it's been a lot lower than that and years that it's been higher than that. So, but historically, we're in the 20 to 25% pass rate. But the, the biggest thing that you need to look at when you, you say, hey, I'm sitting at home, I've got this pretty good dog and I'd, I'd like to go, you know, take a chance at the grand. And, and I'll, I'll have one statement that as grand chairman that I always like to say is, you are never going to pass the grand sitting at home. So, you know, it, it takes a lot of courage, um, you know, and, and, and to jump up there and, and say you're going to run the grand and it's very doable for the amateur. Um, you know, we have a lot of amateurs that run run the grand and do very successful at it. And, and that's that's the pride of the organization there. Uh, a lot of pros run it, but, you know, they they should be bringing you dogs. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, we, we just want to see that that good dog. So if you're if you're sitting at home and you say I, I'd like to take my chances and, and go and, and look at the grand is you need to be able to go to other other clubs and other venues and and you know travel just a little bit and if you've got a good consistent pass rate your dog's a good marker runs pretty solid blinds then I say bring them you know that you stand a good a chance as anybody else and uh, you know but be be critical of our, our, our yourself and make sure that you've got a good solid dog that, you know, is, is able to mark and, and run good solid blinds. Sure. If you're squeaking by every weekend, the grand might not be for you. Might eat so your lunch a little bit, huh? It might eat your lunch. It's a very humbling experience. Yeah. Now let's talk a little bit about the format of the grand. Somebody shows up to, to run in their first grand. What can they expect? I know you mentioned there's 10 flights, but there's five series. How does that kind of work for somebody who, you know, is showing up to their first grant or, or our listeners who aren't familiar with the retriever program? Gotcha. Well, uh, you know, since since the COVID pandemic, um, you know, it's changed how we've had to manage things a little bit. And you hate to refer back to that, but it has. And, uh, you know, we usually have a, a banquet type scenario on, on the evening before it starts. And that's where we do a draw. Um, since COVID, we've had to modify that a little bit, and we're working to get that back in, you know, the banquet and, and get to see everybody and visit before we get to work. But uh, we do a draw, and uh, you're assigned prior when you enter. We have a closing, electronic entry. We have a closing, usually six weeks out, five weeks out, to give us time to manage all that information. You enter the event, and then you'll be assigned into a flight, and we do that with number of dogs and handlers, and try to space it out so that we're just not killing one group. And you know, it's it's two or three handlers and one with thirty dogs each. So we we mix that up, and then uh, once we get there, you'll be assigned a flight alphabetically. And then on the night before the event, we'll have the draw. And the way we do it now is we draw um, the the flight, and we'll do a random draw out of a hat. 
and you'll start there and then we do a draw for the site location and that will whether you depart you know whatever our sponsor site is land or water and then we'll start there and then we just go alphabetically across there so all that is uh is you know social media streamed and everything or live if, if we're able to get a banquet together and, and host a banquet and so whenever you do that there's uh social media has tr been tremendous at helping us so i think it's it's huge in our success and uh advertising out there is it gets that information out there so we utilize it as a tool and all that information of where to be when to be the maps and sites and all that is all going to be posted on social media our public relations group for the grand headed by Lori greer they're incredible they're the catch-all do all everything so uh th those uh folks there work very hard absolutely so with there being you know, in the past few years, 10 flights to accommodate all the dogs. Um, how does that work for the order of things, right? So not everyone's going to start on land. Some people might start on water. Some people might start on land. And there's some test sites that you aren't going to see over your time there. Um, how does that format boast for people? Does it, you know, and, and how difficult is it as, you know, grand chairman to, to, ensure that all these test sites are of a similar uh, or a consistent difficulty well it, once we once we outgrew the four flight for, format um you know there there was obviously some uh some struggle with it and uh you know it's a learning curve for all of us and and handlers included and, uh, but I think that uh, what we've been able to do is have an extreme confidence in the Grand Committee on, on consistency. And, and uh, you know, when you're at the Grand, there's, there's an old saying there is you don't want any, uh, you don't need good luck. You just don't need any bad luck. And, uh, you know, so weather plays a huge uh, influence on those kinds of things. But as the Grand Committee and the, the 15 members of the Grand Committee, when we get there and we look at sites and we work with judges, is that's our function is to go around and that, that we have those sites at the same level of uh, difficulty and consistency. And, and, and it's a struggle. And I mean, it, there can be little things and then you throw the weather variabilities in there, and, you know, uh, lighting conditions and stuff like that. It can be a real struggle, but uh, we work hard at it. Uh, I have a great group on the, the grand committee that, that works with the judges and, and those men and women, you know, they give it their all and, and to put on a quality event. But that, that's where that consistency comes from. And, and as we've grown past six flights, eight flights, and 10 flights, and now, you know, even the handlers are talking about, when we go into 12, when we go into 12, you know, I, I think that they enjoy it. Nobody, in, once we pass six flights, nobody runs the same test. So uh, you, you, everybody, it's just the randomness of the draw and the, the luck of the draw and, you know, where you start and where you finish and, you know, this, uh, but they, we have a, a very good faith at, that the handlers have, have instilled upon us to, to make sure these tests are consistent and challenging. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, we talk about the, the order of operations now. Is it always going to be land, water, land, water, land? Or are you could possibly, or excuse me, land, water, land, water? Or could you possibly run like two waters and your two lands? Or what, what's that format look like for the listeners who, who aren't super familiar or haven't been to the first grand? I, I would say that we would stay on the format that we are um, flipping back between land and water. Um, you know, just, just for the fact of that's consistency of what we've done throughout history. Um, you know, there's... In prior times, the Grand had the uh, Upland as the third series, you know, so it was in the middle of the event. And, uh, you know, it's a numbers game. You know, whenever you've got to switch and do the Upland, it, it, it's very manpower intensive. And, you know, and, and it's better for us to do that at the end of the Grand um, than in the middle because it involves live gunners and planners. And, I mean, it's a if you've, you've been to the Upland, you see what it's a, a sea of orange it's like somebody kicked over an ant bed and, and all those pieces there with the, the site coordinators that work there. And, you know, they're, they're moving around planting birds and gunners are there shooting because that involves live ammo of, of trying to take those birds. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of moving parts to the up one. So I, I don't see it changing away from the fifth series, but I, I, the others, you know, time will tell, but we like that format we're on now is, you know, it gives you a, a break, you know, you're not just stuck on land or, or stuck on water. Mm -hmm. 
So it, uh, it gives you that chance to balance things out a little bit. Yeah. I know I've heard, you know, different, different opinions on, on the way the old format was with Upland in the middle and the way it is now. And it seems like it's just 50, 50. Cause some people said, you know, you do that in the middle and then you go back to your retriever work. You might lose your dog on retriever work because you, that Upland side of it's a little bit looser. It's giving your dog a little bit more control and, and allowing them to make some more decisions on their own. Whereas, you know, that retriever side of it's very, very strictly regimented and it's, very specific um pass for these dogs it's not just there there's some birds in this field go find them and and pray they sit and then other people say well you know now with the, the fist series you've been running a dog no collar for four days and you're adding that extra rigor of i really need you to sit after i kick you loose in this field and we get a bird so you know it seems like whichever way you cut it it's going to come with its own um its own challenges and either way I, i'm sure it's still it still affects these dogs in similar ways that you're truly finding out who the the grand level dogs are well, that's right you know and, and you know we talk about the the precision and style and control that you have in in the retriever series and then you're asking that dog to uh to to go and hunt on his own and engage but still be under grand level control and all that you know that's that's the quintessential grand dog. That's that's why, you know, I, it's it's my opinion, but it's near and dear to my heart that that's the best hunting dog that there is. So you and I go and we we have us a nice nice little duck pond that we slip into and we get us a, a limit of ducks in the morning. And then uh, on the way out of there, we said, man, I've seen a lot of pheasants up in this field here. And we we go up here and they're chuckers or quail or whatever, and we we pull them out and. I don't have to go to the truck and get a different dog. I, I can take the same dog that I have beside me. And man, we can have what a great day in the outdoors that we can have with that grand dog. So, I mean, that's, that's what we're looking for. Um, you know, it's, it's a test. It's not easy. It's difficult. That's why that grand champion means something is it's, it's a prestigious title and it doesn't matter who's handling that dog. When at the end, when you get that green ribbon, you earned that thing. And I am proud to give it to you. Absolutely. So that's uh, that's one of my benefits as chairman is getting up to shake those great handlers' hand and, and uh, you know name those dogs. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, it's it is kind of funny about the format though because that fist series is kind of the notorious fist series. That that series of Upland, everyone's just you know a little bit on edge, and it's funny because a couple weeks ago I was running my puppy and started, and they had couple open spots in Upland so I day of entered my older female since I had her with me I was like well you know worst case club gets some money and best case I walk away with a couple extra ribbons and some more points on her and that was the first time I had ever done Upland with her first I hadn't even done any like Upland training which is my own fault but uh, the nerve-wracking feeling of it just being a weekend Upland test that doesn't really mean much and thinking about the the magnification of that, how it must feel to to walk to the line, knowing that you know this is for the grand. This is the last the last box I need to check to get that grand ribbon. It definitely put some some things into perspective for me for what those handlers are feeling in that moment and in that situation. That's right. All day of boredom for five minutes of sheer terror. That's right. So, you know, they, uh, but it, it's, it's the uniqueness of the event. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, I, I've been there with that heartbreak, you know, right beside them and, and my own dogs and, uh, you know, it's, it's there, but you know, you, in the HRC program, if you want to say you have the best of the best, then it's got to have that upland component in there. And, uh, you know, we are consistent with the way that we set it up. Um, there's nobody coming to the grand that, that, doesn't understand how we do the the upland setup there the committee sets it up um you know so it's it's consistent grand to grand to grand and uh you know it's a it's it's a fun part of it we look forward to it but that that agony of defeat there is it's it's strong so but it's the reward is is you now now have a grand pass you know so that's uh that's that dog though dominic is you know you and i are hunting together and we can do anything we want anywhere in the U.S. and Canada, and, and we have the best dog for the job. Go anywhere, do anything type of dogs. That's it, buddy. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, it, it's always gracious of these different um, WMAs and uh, private land holders to allow people to, to use these grounds. So you know, every grand 
you know, the whole grand committee is appreciative and the HRC program is appreciative of being able to use them. Can you think, like, is there one specific grand, though, that sticks out in your mind for your favorite grounds or your favorite test that happened in it or, or you know, what, what comes to mind if I ask what's your favorite grand and why? Man, you are not going to pin me down like that, Dominic. <laughs> I love them all. Um, you know, but it, I'll tell you what, what I love as chairman and, and, you know, what drives me to continue and, and be passionate about it is the variety. And, uh, you know, it's, it's the local club members. You know, I have thousands of, of acquaintances and friends across the country that I wouldn't have if it wasn't for HRC and the dogs and the grant. And, uh, you know, that's, that's what I enjoy about it. They all have something unique about them. And, uh, you know, we, we got, we've got the legends, you've got Mudzilla out in Oklahoma and you could think, well, Oklahoma is a pretty dry state, but we had a test out there that one time that was in, in running water, that was mud. And I mean, the dogs that, that passed that grand earned it, they physically earned it. And, you know, that, that one sticks out. I, I wouldn't call it my favorite, but it's, you know, there's, there's always stick out down in, in, uh, Louisiana, we had some down in some rice fields down there. And, you know, that's, that's the heart of our program there is you know, that's duck hunting there, you know, we, we'd shoot some teal in there in a minute, you know, mm-hmm. and, and that's, that, that's really cool. The Western Kentucky, you know, these, these open fields with the geese and, you know, the little small duck ponds, that's great. East Carolina, you get, we've been at Chira and, and the grounds and Anderson and, you know, just different places that that's every, every grand has something unique about it that, that just makes it stick out. And, and I enjoy them all. So. Sure. Uh, so the 23 fall grand was just in Paducah. Do you guys have it determined where the next grand or the next couple of grands are going to be yet? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're working out about, uh, I like to actively work on about the three grands that are on deck. And then, and then we've got about five grands in the works right now. Um, you know, we, we have a pretty good uh, list of, of clubs wanting to host it. But the spring grand for 2024 will be down in Omaha, Georgia, and uh, that will be at the W.C. Bradley Forum again. An incredible place. Um, Old South Hunting Retriever Club will be hosting that, and they have an incredible relationship with uh, W.C. Bradley Corporation, and their grounds are, they are a, a hunter's paradise down there. Um, it, it's its a really enjoyable place to be, and, and we really enjoy being there. And uh, it's close to home, too, so uh, I, I like that. Yeah. But, uh, you know, then the, the fall grand of, 2024 will be uh, back in Nashville. I'm sorry, uh, let's get myself mixed up. We'll be in St. Louis, uh, Missouri. Okay. Back at Bush Wildlife out there. We've had a grand out there. It'll be hosted by Gateway Retriever Club and uh, did a great job. That's another another facility that's that's manicured for retriever events and, and trials. And so it's it's always good to be there and uh, be around those clubs out there. And, and they have an incredible place. And uh, St. Louis is a great host. So, and then the uh, spring of 25 will be in uh, at the Bong Recreational Area up in uh, northern uh, Illinois, Wisconsin area up there, hosted by Whistle HRC. And they've hosted uh, three grands before. So we've we'll always had a great event up there. And uh, that'll be in spring of 25. And then fall of 25, we'll be back at the... Uh, grounds in uh pool knob in nashville tennessee i believe you, you came down there and we visited mm-hmm. that one. so those, that's that's the next three on deck um you know and then we have other clubs that are that are online and you know we just can't deal with more than about three at a time so sure but that's where we're headed yeah i know i've been to quite a few grants now since i've been in this position and you know being a duck hunter myself like you said you you see these test sites and you're like I, I want to be back here in the middle of duck season. Like just put me up in here and let me, let me have fun. Absolutely. And I mean, some of them, they've even got wild ducks are dropping in behind the marks and stuff during, during these tests. I mean, it, it can't get more realistic than, than the grounds that, that these grands are being hosted at. So leave, leaving Kentucky, there was ducks in the ponds there when we were going out and picking sites and, the WC Bradley Forum will have ducks in those ponds that we'll, we'll have to run out of there and try to get them to go visit somewhere else while we're there. And, uh, you know, it's just that that's part part of the event and the allure. Um, you know, the clubs in Iowa that, that hosted the Grand up there on the Mississippi River, we've been in some oxbows there that were just full of ducks and geese. You know, just that that's that's what we are. We are the hunting retriever club, you know, so that's that's what we look for. And, and man, it, it, 
when I walk away from a grand site and go, we would come right here and hunt ducks that I know we're at the right place. That's right. Conceived by hunters for hunters, right? That's it, buddy. So as far as uh, you mentioned some of these sites that you're returning to, do you have a certain club that's hosted the most grands? It's, is that a, a metric that anybody's thought to, to track? No, but that's a good one to put on my list of uh, who's who's hosted the most. Uh, it's you have some clubs that take a, a great pride in it, and you know they're they're in that every every three or four year rotation. Old South has had, uh, I believe, this will be their fifth grand. You know the the Kentucky group is is on their their next one will be their fourth, so they've had three grands there. You know the St. Louis group. I mean. Uh, it, it just it varies around a lot of clubs, you know, the stronger clubs and, you know, but a small club can do it, too. Mm -hmm. You know, they just have to pull their resources and manage their resources. Wasn't uh, it's, uh, it was a joint effort for the, the Natchez grant a few years back, right? A couple of different clubs got together to help on that one. Or am I mistaken? The, the Amy River was the host club, but all the clubs in Louisiana supported them down there uh, last, last two springs ago. Mm -hmm. So, yep, that was a great grand down there. That was a new spot for us. Yeah, I remember those grands, too. Uh, like I said, every grand I've been to, it's, it's you know, phenomenal that you guys can find those grands. Meanwhile, on the weekend, I'm struggling to find a swim-by pond to train on. Got to have that local group. They're, they they know where they're at, their resources and their access is. And, you know, it's it's such a cool event, um, you know, that we, we have people, when they find out about it, you know, and we come there, they they want to well, when can we have it again you know and and that's uh that's that's a real good feeling and the community is is always embraces us and you know that's that's you know part of it there too and it, with the growth and the social media coverage and you know there's a lot of folks the sponsors that are looking at us now you know it money drives it you know uh, it, and unfortunately it, it has to has to have money involved in it to, to keep it going and keep it growing so uh, you know the the corporate sponsors we have are incredible. And uh, Purina and Avery and Banded and, and uh, Garmin, you know, just go right down the list. They're they're incredibly supportive. Sure. Um, tell me a little bit about. It. We'll we'll kind of sidestep here from the grant in general and talk a little bit personal. What was your first grant like? Uh, my first grant was uh, I judged in two thousand six down uh, near Savannah, Georgia, and. Uh, for a coastal empire grand down there and um it, it was overwhelming i had judged a lot of finished around and um uh, you know it, it, one of those one of those people that was terrorized of the grand you know because the the legends of the grand and how hard it was and you know critical of, of my own dog and my own abilities and then once once you get there if you are a dog person and, and a retriever enthusiast you get to the grand it'll hook you it's it's just incredible. It's it's just like that person that shows up for their first started test. If they if they love dogs and love the outdoors and duck hunting and and you know those kinds of things, that first started test will get you hooked. That first grand will get you hooked. Yeah. So it's uh it's it's a really cool event. Um, you know, and then I, I judged it four times and then got back on the committee and you know it's uh it's just haven't stopped since then. So sure. So. You know, we, we went over a little bit about where the next couple of grands are. And, and like Tracy said, you know, you go to one of these and it really puts it into perspective the amount of training and the effort and the, the genetics in these dogs. So if you hear this episode and you know you're around that area, definitely swing by and try to check one of those out. You know, it's a welcoming community. Uh, if you have questions and you don't even know what you're looking at, you can ask somebody and they'll explain everything to you. And and you know, you'll probably end up finding yourself there a few years later. Absolutely. You know, that's, that's one of the biggest prides of, of our program is, you know, we're about improving purebred hunting dogs and uh, you know, the grand is taking it to a level now that, that, you know, when we first got into this, we, we looked for dogs outside of other venues to bring into this venue to, Oh, this is a better dog. Let me bring it in here and do this. Now, if you are a serious grand competitor from the amateur to the pro level, is you look for those grand champions in that pedigree, you know, and, and you know, you look at that and say, what do I need to complement that with? And, you know, it's really tying it all together, Dominic, but the grand champion, if you want to be competitive here, you need to look for grand champions in that pedigree. And it's in whatever breed that you choose. You know, it's uh, just, just like a lot of other venues where 
dominated by one breed of dogs, but there's been many a Chesapeake and many of uh, Golden Retrievers. Uh, we have a flat coat Grand Champions, Boykin Spaniels. I mean, they, they can all do it. It's the matter of, of how good a dog and the intensity of your training and, you know, what your training group, it takes a, a good group to, to be involved at the grand level. So. Sure. I'm, I'm friends with quite a few people in, in the hunting retriever club world. And I know whenever I see the grand is, you know, the week of the grand, I'm seeing everyone out with, with friends that they're on different training grounds or trying to get tuned up right before, get the, that last minute uh, dust knocked off and get the stink knocked off of the dogs. And, you know, it's, it shows how much of a community is built within the grand to have friends all over the country, wherever the grand's being hosted and know that you can turn to someone and be able to find somewhere to train up to that level right beforehand. And there's absolutely, there's always someone with the Blackstone too making breakfast. That's it. And that's the, the camaraderie of the event is, is incredible. You know, and that's, like I said earlier is, is I have these thousands of acquaintances and friends that I have now that, that are my dog people, you know, and, and, uh, that that's it is uh you know you go down through there and we were doing it at the uh at the upland just a, a week or so ago and uh we were up judging and all you could smell was bacon cooking and everything and everybody was so hungry you know but that that's the camaraderie of it you know and you could walk to any truck there and someone's going to feed you and someone's going to talk to you and hang out with you and you know that that's the enjoyable part of it you know it's the the intensity of the event and then the camaraderie with the handlers and the owners and, you know, we, we work hard to be spectator friendly. It doesn't always work out, but, you know, we want the owners to be part of that, not just the handlers, you know, mm -hmm. and family. And, you know, you get to see those folks that you don't get to see any other time of the year. So sure. that's, that's a cool thing about the grand and the more it grows, the better that gets. Absolutely. What, um, what are some of the goals for, for the grand moving forward? Are there certain, certain milestones you guys are looking to hit in the near future i know being right there on the cusp of, the, of a thousand it has to be on the horizon it's well it's uh you know time management is is always an issue for us um so we we always look at what is our breakover number um you know where we need to expand our flights um you know along with that comes the management of those extra flights adding those extra judges you know we're on a 20 judge format now you add two more because you, you have to add two flights. You can't just add one flight. So, you know, that increases four more judges, committee members, you know, it just goes down the line. So, you know, our goal is always be able to manage that effectively and, and get it done in time. You know, our goal is on that, that fourth retriever day, we'd like to be done before two o'clock. So everyone has time to go and decompress and change gears into that upland mode and give them some time to get away from that retrieving and, and get back into getting that dog to hunt. So, you know, we, we want to time manage to be able to do that. So that's always a milestone for us. Um, the numbers, uh, I'm not worried about numbers that they're, they're going to grow as the success of the event grows and, uh, we're just going to enjoy it and, and appreciate it. So it's, uh, it's, it's a, it's a good thing there. Uh, numbers fluctuate. So we, we will fluctuate with entries and do what we need to do. That's a good position to be in. But uh, I, th I think that we're just on a positive note and uh, I like it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited for the growth. I know, I think it was, I think it was Music City. Omar Driscoll was, was, uh, I think he stopped by there or something and somebody was riding around with them and showing them all the trucks at all the sites and said, here, here it is. Here's here's the vision. Here's the idea from way back mm -hmm. when, and and we're here. Yeah, it, Omar came to uh, to the A Meet Grand there in uh, Natchez, and then I I took him around, and some of my other committee members, um, you know, got to spend time with him, and uh, you know, he he's he's been to several grands. Uh, anytime we get close to to Lake Village, uh, we we try to get Omar over and and get him to visit. You know, he he is the the founder of our organization and you know we always want to to show off to him i mean it, that we've carried his vision forward and you know we're keeping the the hunt and the hunting retriever and and keep keep the vision moving forward and building our organization and he is amazed um you know our hunt secretaries there there's uh two official ones and two unofficial ones so it's it's four ladies that that run all of that information the entries the flighting the the running orders the uh 
the scoring every night, you know, when you come in, you're given a score and, and all that goes in there. They're entering all that information and managing and building running orders the next day. You know, he, he thought we still did all that on paper with a tablet, you know, and, and just writing everything down. And it's like, no, we have computer programs for that. You know, we, we manage that and build that. And, you know, he was just amazed at that. And, and that's, that's a cool thing. You know, there's, there's a man that had a vision almost 50 years ago now, and, and we brought it to fruition and continue to grow it and see that vision. Absolutely. That's, you know, a huge congratulations to you guys to, to have all that success that you've, you've accomplished with the grand and, and the huge undertaking that the whole committee and the whole community around it has uh, has managed to build uh, but yeah I, I think a lot of our listeners will or will walk away even without being able to see a grand if they've never seen one they can kind of get an appreciation for the the magnitude of this event and and what really goes into it uh, you know, I, I appreciate you taking the time to sit down with us and, and discuss this some um, Absolutely. Uh, anytime that I can talk about this, like I said earlier, it's one of my favorite subjects. And, uh, you know, I put a lot of heart and passion into it. And, and the group on the grand committee, you know, all members of the grand committee, the site coordinators, public relations, and I, I can't brag on them enough. You know, they're, they're just, remember, this is a volunteer effort. There's nobody gets paid for this. You know, the, the whole HRC program is, is a volunteer effort. And, that, and that's probably the coolest thing about the whole deal is these are like-minded retriever folks out there giving it their all and the group that that i have and, and you know i use that singular donation there is it but as as the leader they, they are my people and uh, i have the greatest group in the world you know their dedication is unreal and uh, i can never thank them enough for the efforts i i get all the accolades and get to do the interviews and, and all of that but that is the backbone of, of the grand is uh i'm just a pretty face <laughs> so. that you are but, uh, you know, they, they're, they're the workers, and, and I would like to take this opportunity to let them know how much I appreciate their efforts. And, uh, you know, the executive committee of HRC, they're elected by the board members, uh, the club members. But uh, I have not been to a grand yet. The, the vast majority of the, the executive committee have, has been not been there. And they, they all there come with their working shoes on. And, uh, you know, they, they just work and support us and you know, there are bosses and uh, you would never know that because they, they have faith in us and we appreciate that. And they're there to help us do everything from handle trash cans to deliver lunches, to help set up tests or what, whatever they need to do. And, you know, it's, it's just a great organization to be involved in. And I'm very thankful to be the chairman. Well, I'm definitely appreciative of having HRC under our umbrella here with UKC and, and being able to support the the mission behind it. and. Um, as a guy that that runs HRC on the weekends too, I'm you know, what, the the grand is a personal goal of mine as well. So, uh, you know, I I appreciate it from a member standpoint as well. The effort that goes into the to the grands. Thank you. Well, we appreciate you taking the time, Tracy. I think you've you've been able to expand on a lot of things that that help our listeners and and understand what goes into the grant even if they're they're a veteran of of the hunting retriever club they might not know some of the stuff that goes on in the background so appreciate you kind of opening and shedding some light on that and and talking to our our uh, coon hound guys or beagle guys or whoever else might be listening as well to to bring them into the hunting retriever world for just a little while good deal come on to the grand and see the show it's incredible Thanks for listening to the UKC Hunting Ops Podcast. Be sure to give us a follow wherever you get your podcasts so you don't miss out on new episodes.